Now today, we're going to finish up Hinduism and go on to Buddhism. But since this is Advent, I'd like to say something about the Christian faith, because the more you study about other religions uh, and the impulses that are common to everybody about whether you're American, Indian, or Hindu, or Buddhist, or uh, Islamic, that impulse of wanting to connect with the transcendent or connect with the divine, that's more like universal. And uh, but different groups of people have different ways of doing this historically. And the, the more you study what other pe how other people make this connection, the more you begin to realize how different the Christian faith really is. How different. Uh, so I'm setting out my Christmas letter, and last year I put on solitary life. I, if you don't get my Christmas letter, it's because you didn't send me a card. <laughs> That's how you get on the list. You send me something. And, uh, anyhow, uh, this this time I put in a little item there that says. Christian faith is not about a man becoming divine. It's about God coming as a human being in Jesus and grow up among us. It's not about our searching for God. It's about God searching for us because after all, God is a loss. Word of us is a loss. It's not about our loving God. It's about God first loving us. And uh, <coughs> So Christian faith is about the God who comes to us, uh, loves us, is on our side, advocates for us, uh, and leads us in our life. So if you get my Christmas letter, that's my Christmas message to everybody. So when we study these other traditions, we recognize how, um, how utterly different, because Christian faith is more about God and what God does. Other religions, to speak uh, generally, a lot of it is about what we do to our consciousness, or what we do in terms of worship, or what we do to get God's attention, or what we do to get God to come and help us. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, we always need to approach other people's religious traditions, you know, with, with respect, because people's religious tradition, traditions being a lot to them, you know. So I always approach this uh, other religious traditions when I'm, uh, I like to have conversation partners with people who belong to other traditions. My default setting is I have something to share and I have something to learn. So when we discuss other religious traditions and we say, now here's something we really need that as Christians we can learn. Doesn't mean I'm going to be a Muslim, I'm going to be a Buddhist, I'm going to be a Hindu, but uh, there are some things there that are kind of interesting. Uh, okay, so, are you ready? Yes. Now, when I see you sitting up, alert, nodding your head, responding, that really energizes me. Okay. <laughs> So, try to do what you can. Keep control of yourself, all right? Today I'd like to start with uh, Hindu Hinduism under British colonialism. And uh, before colonialism, St. Thomas the Apostle is said to have brought Christianity to India. So, St. Thomas is one of the uh, disciples. And then later on, Roman Catholic, uh, Missionary St. Francis Xavier arrived in India in 1542. So this is all before British colonialism. <clears throat> At first it was the East India Company that ruled India beginning in 1757, but in 1858 that responsibility was assumed by the British Crown. Because when the East India Company went there to do tr to business, to trade, uh, their, their trading posts became military uh, uh, settlements because they had to protect themselves and, and, uh, and so forth. And
And what the British did was they established schools to train Indian workers for the lower levels of British bureaucracy uh, in India. <clears throat> and the William Carey was one of the first uh, missionary and modern Protestant missionary in modern times to arrive in India. That's 1873. <clears throat> and what missionaries did was they challenged Hindu theology, that is the way they understand the divine, the ritual practices, the morality, and the caste system. I mean, missionaries went to India and encountered Hinduism and found some things about Hinduism that actually needed to be changed. Despite the many inducements that Christian culture offered in the day of British rule, few Hindus abandoned the indigenous faith. I mean, there is a Christian community in India, but it's not a large community. Uh, most people in India remain uh, Hindu. What the British brought to India was a materialistic scientific worldview. Now this is new for the people in India. A uh, humanistic critique of religion. Racial theories proclaiming European superiority. And the triumphalist teachings of some outspoken missionary, uh, Christian missionaries. That is like, our religion is better than your religion. Our science is better than your understanding of the material universe. I mean, everything about us is better than... Uh... So Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs vied with each other for favorable treatment from the British, while the British use a divide and conquer strategy toward the different traditions. So you have the uh, Hindus, you have the the Muslims, because uh, the Mongols came into India, and then you also have the uh, Sikhs. Some Indians were hostile to the British, others developed an interest in the European uh, civilization. Now, there were some really bright, intelligent, well-informed Indian reformers that, who defended Hinduism against missionary attacks, but at the same time, they recognized the validity of some of the criticism. Uh, so they also called for the elimination of the superstition, caste discrimination, and widow immolation. That is, some people practice when the husband dies and, and they burn in the funeral pyre that the widow kind of throws herself into it. If it's some Hindus began to to think that maybe this is not the right thing to do. <laughs> Protestant teachings were especially influential for Indian reformers who sought to reform their own traditions. So Protestant Hinduism was used to protest British imperialism. One belief that came to prominence was that the entire universe is permeated with the divine spirit called by different names by different people. There are therefore many different paths to God. So this, the Hindu, the Hindu attitude is that uh, it doesn't matter what tradition you belong to, what God you worship, uh, what rituals you follow, these are all different ways to reach the, like, the same God. So if you go to, go to India and uh, you be the Hindu and you say I'm a Christian, they just consider what well, that's just one more way that you can approach the divine. And so sometimes people would say Hinduism is accepting, is tolerant, it respects other religious traditions as valid ways of uh, approaching God, whereas in their criticism of Christians, we say there's only one way. You know, there's no other way, there's just this one way. So, so that's a little theological thing that you might want to think about. So the spirit of Hindu tolerance was contrasted by these Hindu reformers 
with what they see as the narrowness of dogmatic Christianity. Gandhi was against high caste discrimination of others and having a class of people who were called the untouchables. Then you have the Brahmin class and then you have the untouchable class. He encouraged the development of small cottage industries and advocated nonviolence in giving leadership to the independence movement. In 1947, independence was achieved. India became a secular state and Pakistan a Muslim state. And now a period of unrest follow, and of course that Pakistan and India, that continues today. Gandhi and Nehru of the Congress Party favor a secular democracy, just like in our country. We're not exactly a Christian nation. Uh, maybe we're a secular uh, democracy, which, uh, which permits you know, the practice of all religious uh, traditions. Uh, <clears throat> but since 1998, those who favor a Hindu religious state have gained control politically. These are the people that are uh, in control now. So here in summary are some contemporary Hindu practices. The guru-disciple relationship. Ashrams under the guidance of a guru provide a place for meditation, study, and devotional practice. So you have Americans going to India and you know, study with a guru. There are various uh, gestures of respect, including drawing palms, bowing, prostration, circum, circum and, well, uh, of an icon or temple. That means walking around, okay. Maybe I'll change this just to say walking around. <laughs> I can't pronounce this. There are also many uh, re religious festivals and pilgrimages. Also life cycle rituals, including coming of age, marriage, uh, funerals, and the temple is uh, the central institution uh, for Hinduism. In 2009, President Obama celebrated a Hindu holiday in the White House with a Hindu priest lighting a candle to symbolize the triumph of light over darkness. Hindu priests have been invited to say prayers both in the Senate and the House of Representatives. You know, it always strikes me kind of a, you can't say prayers in public school, but the Senate can have a chapel. <laughs> <Okay. clears throat> Here are some persistent religious understandings. <clears throat> Hindus believe that the presence of the divine underlies the material world and the desire to connect with the worship and worship the divine remains very strong in India. In this sense, the Indians are very religious people because beyond the material, they believe in the divine reality. Now, if you're completely materialistic, <coughs> You would say, this is, the material world is all there is, there's nothing beyond that. But if you believe that there's something beyond that, which is called the divine or the transcendent, uh, this is what, they have a very strong sense of that. Hinduism accepts alternative opposing views and recognizes that every understanding is necessarily incomplete. 
In this context, how does Christian faith proclaim that Jesus is the only way to God? So I'm not addressing that question, I'm just raising it because of course this is As a nation, India needs to demonstrate how Hindu values, beliefs, and conscience can serve the needs of its one billion citizens. Now, the Hindu thinkers, they say, they look at China, and they say, how come China is making all that progress and we're not? All right, so does, do Chinese values, culture, religious practices uh, make for uh, the development of the country, or is there something about Hinduism that somehow doesn't do that to the same degree? So thoughtful Indians are thinking about how our religious tradition uh, helps us in our daily life. So, for example, in India, they're trying to clean up the the, the, the big Ganges. The big Ganges is completely polluted. But uh, and they, they pour quite a bit of money. There's a, a, a they made very little progress in actually, you know, cleaning up the Ganges. So they have to face a lot of these problems uh, today. You know, Hinduism wouldn't be the third largest religion in the world, except that in India, there's like almost a billion people. China has 1.3 billion, and it has a billion people. So, <clears throat> I love this. <laughs> <laughs> this usually wakes the people up and prepares us for them. Okay. <clears throat> now, in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to kind of introduce you to, uh, to Buddhism. There are 350 million Buddhists with 98% in, in Asia and there are 700,000 monks and nuns worldwide. Buddhists are the majority in uh, Sri Lanka, in uh, Myanmar, which is Burma, in Thailand, in Laos, in Cambodia, and in Japan. Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. All right. Now here's a. So Buddhism began with a man named Siddhartha Gautama, who was born in 563 before the Common Era, to a water caste parents who ruled a small state in the foothills of the Himalayas. Now Siddhartha refers to his given name, meaning one who has attained a goal. So Satata is like, my name is James, that was his name is Satata. And his family name is Katama. So you say, what's his name? It's Satata Katama. That's his family name. The Buddha, Buddha means the enlightened one. So you say, Satata, the enlightened one. So. Actually, strictly speaking, you should say uh, Sadata the Buddha, all right? Or Katama the Buddha, or like we say, Jesus the Christ, right? The anointed one, the chosen one. So, <clears throat> he also goes by another name, Sakya Muni, meaning the sage from the Sakya clan, because it belongs to the Sakya clan. So you often, you often come to the Sakyamuni refers to Sadata Gautama, who is the Buddha, the one who becomes enlightened. Before, well now if you become enlightened, that be, for, the, for Buddhists the main problem is ignorance. You don't understand. When you become enlightened, you understand. So if you ask a Buddhist monk, what is the one thing needful? They would say, you have to know yourself. So, 
when you're a Christian, they say, well, what's the, the, our, the Christian diagnosis of what's wrong with us is that we're out of relationship with God because we don't love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then everything begins to unravel. All right? Then our relationships with each other, everything begins to unravel. So when you and I get our relationship with God square away, then the other things about our relationships, you know, they find their proper place. Now he lived a protected life with, within the palace walls because his family was trying to protect him from uh, the reality of uh, uh, the suffering of involving human life. But his life was profoundly changed when he went outside the palace walls and he saw human suffering and death. So at age 29, he left his family to pursue a spiritual quest. How do we get out of this? All right. He studied with two successive gurus. He practiced fasting, breath control, and sitting long hours in unmoving uh, meditation. So this is the ascetic phrase of his life. You see, he, he, he's completely skin and bones. And from this experience, Sadata chose a middle way between severe ascetic practices and sense indulgence. All right, so uh, sense indulgence means, you know, uh, every, all the central pleasures and life is just all pleasure. And then in order to counteract that, you know, you live an ascetic life, right? You, uh, so he chose the middle way. And one day sitting under a Bodhi tree, he attained enlightenment, extinguishing all desires and ignorance and fully realizing his capacity for insight. And then he gathered together his former ascetic colleagues and enlightened them with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And he told them to spread his teachings using the local dialect, not Sanskrit, as is the practice with the Brahman priests. The Buddha urged his disciples not to engage in idle speculation on mere intellectualism. I mean, the whole idea is not to sit around and talk about ideas. I mean, the whole idea of Buddhism is you have to change your life. You have to change the way you see things. Uh, and he urged them to work toward achieving nirvana by quoting the feverish hindrance of greed, hatred, and delusion that creates karma and binds the individual to samsara, the world of birth and suffering. <laughs> now, both men and women can realize nirvana through the cultivation of insight, more living and proper meditation. Now here's the Four Noble Truths. Now this is, the Four Noble Truths, this is, this, uh, uh, Gautama's diagnosis of what's wrong. <coughs> because you go to see your doctor, first thing he needs to do is he has to have an accurate diagnosis. Then he has a plan for treatment. So the four noble truths are the Buddha's diagnosis about what's wrong. What's wrong. All life is suffering. I mean, why, why are you laughing? <laughs> well, all life is suffering, all right? The cause of suffering is desire. All the things that human beings thirst after. Now, <laughs> there's a, a prayer from the Book of Common Prayer that I use at funerals, and it's, O oh Lord, protect us all the day long until the Shabbos lengthen, and the evening falls, and the busy world is hushed, and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Do you hear that? The fever of life, right? The fever of life. That, 
the desiring, the wanting, the attachment, the, the striving, uh, the judging. I mean, if you say, I like long grass, but I don't like the short grass, you're, that's suffering that, <laughs> I mean, why do you just let things be? So, I'm just thinking throughout the day, we're kind of generating all these things out there that actually cause us discomfort. So, a great deal of our discomfort are, is caused by the fact that we're out there grasping, attaching, losing, right, gaining and losing and so forth, competing. That's all generated from us, all right? We have to do something about that. It's like, you're not going to get at the root of suffering unless you do something about that. And that is why when you see the Buddha, he's always sitting in meditation. This is kind of a yoga position, the legs are crossed, the hands are this way, kind of uh, eyes are downcast. And why are they doing that? Because you imagine that uh, a kind of a pool of water and it's, uh, it's muddy and you cannot actually see through. So you have to be quiet and kind of let that slowly kind of settle down, right? So, uh, if you ever try that, it's very hard to do because your mind is always going everywhere, wanting, desiring, hoping, fearing, and so on. It's all self-generated. It's all self-generated. So the Buddha is sitting there and kind of letting all of these things kind of settle down. So that's why you see the Buddha uh, is always in meditation. Quiet. We have to quiet things down. We have to do something about this fever of life, this fire, this desire that's kept. So, so <coughs> Buddhism uh, uh, requires us to uh, uh, do something about this, okay? So, so, uh, so you remove the desire, you remove the suffering. Desire is removed by following the Eightfold Path. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> now, this is the plan, all right? It's like reducing. You want to lose weight, or the problem is you're eating too much, right? <laughs> you can't control your, your desire for food. So how do you, well, we have this Eightfold Plan, okay, this, for losing weight. So, so this Eightfold Plan is a way to do something about the fever of life, all right. Fifth aid for bad. It's a practical plan. And it, this wheel that you often see as a symbol of Buddhism is symbol. <coughs> the fir first of all, that has to do with the insight. First of all, you have to have the you have to have the right understanding of what's wrong. The right view, especially about the four noble truths. You have to understand that your suffering is caused by all this kind of grasping, uh, hating, w uh, wondering, and so on. That's, you, you have to understand that. And then uh, you have to clean your thoughts up, you know, so it's free from, from, from hatred. So that's the first part. They have to do uh, with your understanding, with your mind, okay. Secondly, <coughs> Buddhists are very moral people. Right. So, you have to learn to control your speech. <laughs> you don't resist the temptation of saying bad things about people. <laughs> and telling lies. I mean, not just straightforward lying, but you know, kind of, uh, what, what do we call it now? Uh, uh, what, 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 there's a term for that, uh, kind of slanting it so that, uh, so speech, spinning, 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 yeah, spinning. 
a speech which is supposed to communicate is now used to slant the truth. That, that's falsehood. Speak the truth. And uh, frivolity. All right, don't tell too many jokes, okay? So. <laughs> so like the book of James says, if you can, can control your speech, because uh, you can control yourself, but if you can't control your speech, you know, you're sort of out of control. Right action. No stealing, no killing, no harming. Right occupation. No occupation involving astrology, the casting of spells, or hurting and killing. <laughs> and then finally, uh, the last three have to do with meditation. Because meditation is the main way in which you can get, get at this. Right effort to calm and clear the mind. Great mindfulness. One way to think about mindfulness, well actually, when we're doing something, our mind is never completely on it. All right. Now, let's suppose you're sitting in the toilet having a bowel movement. Right? <laughs> what are you doing? You're reading a magazine, right? <laughs> I mean, you never think of, uh, never think of, what a wonderful feeling it is, you know, to have your body doing all that stuff automatically. Right? Even in the 70s. <laughs> or you, you think like eating. When you're eating, Marie says, you know, it doesn't matter what you feed James. He doesn't know what he's eating anyway. <laughs> because our mind is not fully on it. We're watching TV while we're eating, are we? And, and, and people think that this is an advance. So, uh, so I've been myself, uh, even though I'm not a real Buddhist, I'm practicing mindfulness. And here's what you do, like, uh, when I'm washing dishes, I'm completely, fully involved. I mean, as I'm whining, I mean, I think of it as I'm serving communion. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm washing uh, the shower, you know, wiping down the shower. I'm saying, I'm a Shinto priest, you know, cleaning up the temple. So your mind is sort of complete. Now, like you take, uh, when you sing a hymn, your mind is not actually, for most of us, our mind is not actually on, completely involved. Our, our mind. We never completely listen either. You're talking to me, or you're talking to your psychiatrist. I don't know how much he's charging you, but uh, we don't know. He's, you're not getting his full attention. Right. We're driving a car and we're listening to the radio. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so now, suppose you go to worship next Sunday, and you're fully present when the hymn is being sung, or you're fully involved. You know when the sermon is being preached. You're, you're fully engaged. Right? So, now I'm talking to you now, are you fully, completely engaged? <laughs> I mean, actually, are you fully, completely engaged? I mean, so, so this is mindfulness. Yeah, this is mindfulness. And do you know what? If you, if you get up in the morning and you start the day, when you're brushing your teeth, give your full attention to that. You, and then I know you can do it automatically, but think how good it really feels to have you. And, <laughs> and then as you move through the day, to kind of do one thing at a time. Do you know at the end of the day, you don't feel wiped out. But if you're doing one thing and thinking of the next thing, or you say, I like it. That's why people that are constantly complaining, they get worn out during the day. Just let things be, you know. So I just say to myself, that's Marie being Marie, all right? <laughs> <laughs> that's John being John, I mean. <laughs> if we can get out of the people correction business, all right, 
that would be a great relief. I'm not in the people correction business anymore. You do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> because every time you make a judgment, I like this, I don't like that. You're causing unnecessary misery for yourself. And bright concentration to advanced meditation that leads to a trance state. Okay, that's the... <laughs> The Sangha is the monastery, and it's uh, one of the main institutions of Buddhism. It provides for the material needs of those who want to meditate and study. Monks uh, serve as teachers, uh, provide life cycle rituals, and at various times have engaged in protests as social activists. This is called engaged Buddhism. Because it sounds like that if you're just kind of concentrating on your mind and, 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 and so on, that it doesn't seem like it has too much to do with all the problems you know, of the real world. So, so Buddhists, uh, in recent times, have emphasized engaged Buddhism, a Buddhism that uh, is interested in the environment, interested in social justice, incident, incident in addressing uh, oppression and so on. The Monks provide services for the community and in return lay people provide their sub for their subsistence and in so doing they gain merit. So actually uh, somebody asked a monk, is it hard to pay? And he said, no, everybody needs other people. Right. Now, so monks actually, they have patrons. So they don't actually go out to the street to do begging. They, they have patrons that actually uh, support them. So uh, it's not just the monks, I mean like, our, we wouldn't have a pastoral staff. I mean, we have a pastoral staff that leads us, that guides us, teaches, teaches us, and so and we support them. Right? It's the same thing, actually. It's, it's exactly the same thing. And uh, the people like me and Daneng and Vizo and so on, we couldn't do our work unless the church people are supporting us. I mean, so some. Some ministers are bivocational, they support themselves, and then they, they serve the church. But like the monks and the lay people, they have this uh, relationship where the monks serve the community by being teachers and doctors and social workers and so on. And then in return, the lay people support them, you know, in, in what they do. <coughs> Uh, the patronage of Emperor Ashoka helped in the early spread of Buddhism. He was held up as the ideal Buddhist ruler. Buddhism has never been a unified faith doctrinally or institutionally. I mean, there's no pope, there's no group of people to say, uh, this is what Buddhism is. And so in time, they've developed 20 schools of doctrinal interpretation. But the one thing that holds them all together are what they call the free refuges. I take my refuge in the Buddha. I take my refuge in the teachings, which is the Dharma. And I take my refuge in the community, which is the Sangha. So, uh, you can say Christians take our refuge in Jesus, we take our refuge in the teachings of Jesus, and we take our refuge in the community, the community of the church. <coughs> if you've been to Hong Kong and the Lan Lantau Island, you've seen this uh, giant Buddha, and uh, Buddhist temples uh, provide a very uh, Beautiful attraction to visitors, and this one uh, I've been there, and I suppose you have as well. Uh, the, the the Buddha 
their their hand mudras, uh, this is called mudras, the hand position, and uh, this one like this is the uh, gesture of assurance, have no fear. So Buddha figures you often see, have no fear, and this is what you see here, and then when, when the hand is outstretched like this, this is a gesture of bestowing blessing. All right, so when you approach uh, an image like this, uh, this is the uh, hand mudra, this is the hand position for reassurance, and uh, this is the hand position for bestowing blessing. Is there a significance of which hand is which? Uh, usually, it's the, usually it's the left hand for the gesture of reassurance, and then, and then there's, there's like there's a teaching gesture and you know, the meditation gesture, there are a lot of different gestures. But it's, it's like watching a football game and you know like the referee has all kinds of gestures, I don't know what they are, but uh, so, so the, the icons, the images of Buddhism, they use standard uh, iconic gestures uh, to convey to the person who is using this image uh, the substance of the faith. So, how did I get there? I thought I went past all this already. Can you read that? <laughs> I think I'll stop there because uh, next week the service starts at 9.30, maybe it will end by 11. Maybe we can get started by what, 11.20. So I'm going to finish this up because I don't want to just kind of refer it. I want to finish this up and then start our talking about East Asian religion, which is Chinese, and then Korean and Japan. Korea and Japan depends a lot on Chinese uh, origins for their uh, beliefs. So, These traditions actually are very rich, and uh, when I do this o overview, I feel like I'm not always doing justice to it, but like I hope that this sort of overview will kind of give you a sort of appreciation. And then if you're reading the book, you know, if you're reading the book on world religions, uh, it doesn't give you too much of the history, but it does give you something of the spiritual essence of each of these traditions and how really beautiful they are. But of course, a tradition within a historical context is always a sort of mix uh, of fun phenomena. So we're also not thinking of the religious belief in its pristine form, but also how it actually functions within a uh, society. Uh, let's close. Uh, Gracious God, we pause to give you thanks for all the different ways that you work in different traditions. That you have put in the heart in our hearts the hungering for something beyond material. That uh, that you that you alone can fill the deepest uh, yearnings of the human heart. And during this Advent season, we thank you especially that uh, you sent your son and came to dwell among us. 
and in him we find our true life. Grant that uh, day by day we may come to a deeper appreciation and awareness of your presence in our life and that uh, we will learn to love you with everything we have and be compassionate to our neighbors who are all your children and whom you love deeply. So guide us and lead us day by day. Help us always to be a grateful, compassionate people. Amen. George will uh, hand out the summary for today, and then I'll see you next week.